Okay, John, this is part of uh, our Parents of the Field project, and we're uh, interviewing uh, people who were responsible for the uh, early years and the development of the field of conflict analysis and resolution, which of course is very closely linked to the um, uh, peace research movement. Um, and we're asking questions about uh, the early years and the early development of the field. Uh, and um, how you see uh, the way in which it's grown over the years, uh, who are key figures and key influences on you in this, in this development. So can I start by asking you, uh, I know you had a, dis uh, a distinguished diplomatic career, but when did you first become aware that there was an academic field of conflict analysis and resolution and uh, who, uh, Sort of introduced you to some of the leading lights in it. Can you remember that? Yes, as a matter of fact, I was <coughs> still at the State Department. I was assigned uh, to the Foreign Service Institute, the training arm of the uh, State Department. And I believe it was 1982, 1983, when I received a call uh, totally out of the blue from the president of American University. Mm -hmm. And he asked me if I would share a panel of a conference that was taking place on his campus. And it turned out it was the uh, second meeting of uh, NCPCR, National oh, Conference okay. of Peacemaking mm -hmm. and Conflict Resolution, which I'd never heard of before. And so, uh, being honored, uh, invited by the president, I of course said yes. And so I attended that conference. And I was quite uh, shocked by what I learned and what I saw, because I saw a whole other world out there outside of the State Department, which I've been a part of for 40 years, the saying that um, there were different ways to do things than the State Department way. And the panel that I chaired uh, was really basically what we now call Track 2, or Citizen Diplomacy, and it consisted of uh, <coughs> Some from the Peace Brigades, which I'd never heard of before, who were operating in, in Central America. <clears throat> there, there was someone who was working on Iranian uh, uh, problems uh, at the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. uh, people that I didn't even know existed. And I became fascinated by this area. Uh, I had had some interaction a few years before with non-governmental organizations, but that was quite limited. Mm -hmm. And it suddenly opened a whole new world for me, and I was fascinated by it, and I pursued it. So that's where it got started. Ah. Well, um, uh, you were head of the FSSU at the time. Did you have um, a great deal of uh, support or, or uh, uh, what, what was the reaction among your colleagues as you were coming back with the, these strange ideas from academia? Well, they were a little bit taken aback, uh, but I continued on my way. I was a part of a, a new office which I helped create in the Foreign Service Institute called the Center for the Study of Foreign Affairs. And there were only about three people in it at that mm -hmm. time, and so we sort of had an open door to begin to explore new ideas and new things. Uh, and I began to do just that. And then uh, Joe Monfield, uh, who was sort of a maverick in the State Department, moved in to the center and became a, was his office is right next to mine. And we began to collaborate and he'd come up, I think it was 1981-82, with the phrase Track 2 Diplomacy, Track 1 being government to government, which I'd done all those years, uh, and uh, always instructed and formal and not very risk-taking. Track 2 was non-government to non-government, it was people to people, it was was risk-taking, and it was innovative, and it wasn't bound by constraints. And so his concept and his title kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so I really got involved then, and I, in 1985, convened the first uh, seminar uh, on Track 2, or Citizen Diplomacy, and then uh, wrote the first book on that subject, and Joe Monfield was the uh, first chapter in that book, uh, mm. and we worked together over the years. It was an interesting uh, 
actually I have a copy of it here, uh, which has now been reprinted in our own format as an institute, but I ran up against the kind of thing you're talking about. I was ready for publication. Everything had been approved, even the cover design, everything ready to go. And when my boss, the assistant secretary, <clears throat> the head of the whole uh, Foreign Service Institute, who had supported the whole idea, um, <clears throat> suddenly decided that he really didn't like John Burton and what John Burton was saying in his mm. book. And that, among other reasons, he was worried about turf. He was worried about what the rest of the Department of State mm. would say. The book came out under a State Department label mm. saying there's another way to do business in the State Department way. So he held up publication. And I went back again and again with no success. So 18 months passed, mm -hmm. and then he got transferred to another post, as this happens in the Foreign Service. And I was still there. Mm -hmm. The next day I got the book published <laughs> by the U.S. Government Printing Office. Well done. <laughs> and uh, it was a revolutionary mm -hmm. document mm -hmm. in 1987 when it came out. And I do believe that in some sectors of the State Department it is still a revolutionary document. They still don't understand the concept mm. of, uh, of, of of citizen diplomacy mm. in any practical way. The meetings that you um, uh, convened in 1985 uh, over at the Foreign Service Institute uh, to your early Track 2 meetings, as they were called, um, can you remember who came to them and, and who was there and who was involved in that process? Well, we had, uh, I said, Joe Monfield was mm -hmm. uh, first, then uh, Philip Stewart, he talked about uh, the Soviet-U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. dialogue. Uh, he was from the uh, Kettering Foundation. Oh, so he must have known Hal Saunders. That's right. He's the one who hired Hal. Ah, okay. Uh, but, uh, and then we had the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, Roland Warren, who'd done some very interesting oh, yeah. work in, uh, in uh, now Zimbabwe. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and he has a great story to tell. We had, of course, Brian Wedge, who oh. founded mm. ICAR, and he talked about Dominican Republic. We had Landrum Bowling, who's still oh, he's, around. He's still around, isn't and he? And you should interview him. Yes, we should. And he talked uh, about Track 2. Uh, and then we had John Burton, mm -hmm. uh, and then we had uh, John Scully, who talked about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, process. yes, of course. He Remember? was the guy who was passing messages. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then lastly, we had uh, Harold Saunders. Ah, okay. So it was a pretty good group of people yeah, who yeah. really knew what they were talking about. Yeah. And I was very proud of that. And I also, you might be interested to know, dedicated this book uh, to Kenneth Bowling. Uh, we were together in Amsterdam on mm -hmm. January the 6th, 1986. <clears throat> and we were both on the same panel. Uh -huh. And you know how he always liked to write things. Mm. Well, after I finished talking, he came up to me and handed me four lines, mm. two couplets. He said, when track one simply will not do, we have to travel on track two. But for results to be abiding, the tracks must meet upon some siding. <laughs> now that doesn't say the whole, capsulate the whole field. <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, it sounds like Kenneth as well. That's right, exactly. Yeah. So as a, as a real uh, early person in the field, yeah. I just thought that that might be of interest to yeah. you historically. Okay, so when did track two become uh, multi-track? Uh, how was the process that uh, that actually uh, suddenly expanded or had children or whatever it was? Let me... Um, expand a little bit further, if I may, before I answer your question, on what I was able to do at the Foreign Service ah, Institute. Okay. Good. Because uh, <clears throat> I think this is important historically. Mm. Uh, my philosophy was that uh, diplomats <clears throat> never had the time to read. Mm. They read their cables and so forth, but they never read outside their immediate problem. Uh, and I recognize also that most academics, unlike yourself, never practiced. And so the two fields <coughs> were passing each other in the night and were not communicating at all. <coughs> and so I decided <coughs> at the Foreign Service Institute at the Center for the Study of Foreign Affairs, maybe we could have some small impact on mm -hmm. that. So over the next several years, and I was there for almost four years, 
Uh, I convened uh, several dozen uh, seminars and uh, uh, which were basically designed to bring people who negotiated agreements from track one mm. to tell their story to an audience of maybe 100, 130 or 40 people. Uh, and then have in the audience, <coughs> basically many of the people in this book, mm. as a core group <coughs> of academics <coughs> who could then ask questions during the session, but then I later convene totally separately a week or two after that symposium for a half a day or a day to critique what they had heard mm -hmm. and to evaluate it and comment on it and then <coughs> produce actually a, <coughs> a series of four books mm -hmm. out of those and in each one of those books <coughs> we'd have a chapter <coughs> about the negotiation and then we have comments by the core group mm -hmm. and sometimes they write a, a chapter sometimes they do a conclusion looking at the various studies together, but they were always involved. Mm -hmm. Bill Zartman, of course, was yes. one of the key persons mm -hmm. in that whole area. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Dan Bruckman was also involved. Yes, I was going to say, Dan He's must have been on your faculty that. now. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, um, they all loved it because uh, it just hadn't ever happened before. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and they got published as well as, as that. So that was a, a very interesting, I think, uh, contribution. And they all got published by the uh, and by the U.S. government printing office, mm -hmm. uh, and so they were out there for people to interact with. Did anybody take up that idea after you'd gone from the Foreign Service no. Institute? Because it seemed to <coughs> actually <coughs> it sort of collapsed. Uh, mm. uh, there was a turf battle between two assistant secretaries at the State Department, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> sort of a year after I left, I, the thing was abolished, mm -hmm. which is very sad because it really was a think tank and uh, it didn't had not existed before or after, in that sense of the word. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, after I <coughs> uh, retired in 87, I became a law professor at George Washington University, <coughs> teaching international negotiations. And then I was invited to become the first president of the Iowa Peace Institute in Grinnell, Iowa. Right. Yes. And so my wife Crystal and I moved to this lovely little town of 9,000 people with a very fine college, Grinnell College, uh, undergraduate college, uh, and we were there for three years, and I started putting into practice the things that I had been writing about and talking about. Um, and during that period, actually it was about 1989, <coughs> Lou Kreisberg from Syracuse mm -hmm. Park, who was another person you might consider interviewing. Yeah, we, um, we have him on the list. And invited me to produce a chapter in a book that he was doing that was funded by the U.S. Peace Institute. And so twice he convened all of the chapter writers mm -hmm. in Syracuse, that park, over a period of several months to meet each other. And very, very, uh, very, very fine approach. So I wrote my chapter on uh, what I call further exploration of track two diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And basically, I expanded the two tracks to five tracks. And track five <coughs> was the media, communications. Track four was people-to-people -people exchanges. Track three was the role of the business community in conflict resolution. This was 1989. Uh, and I think I was the first out there to propose the role of business. Yeah. And then track two and track one, and it was a vertical line, uh, yeah. so I'm trying to impact on track one. Well, I wrote the chapter and I sent it in and <clears throat> he sent it out to all the other chapters, to readers, as the, seems to be the custom. And a few months later, I got uh, two blind copies of letters mm -hmm. without uh, <clears throat> a signature, really. And they were really only one sentence long. And both of them from two different people said, this chapter is not publishable. I seem to have trouble with my publications. <laughs> oh, I've had I've had things like that. Well, <laughs> only mine are longer and ruder. <laughs> well, I'll tell you another story about that too. Um, but um, what happened was that I then called up Lou, mm. and I said, Lou, I got these two letters that saying that this is not publishable material. I'm a little offended by this. Mm. 
and he was in a state of shock. He said, that's terrible. You know, that can't have that. I will publish your chapter. I said, fine. <laughs> and so the book was finally published, mm -hmm. and it was published by the U.S. Peace Institute because they'd funded it. And so they issued a press release, a four-page press release. I got a copy at some point, and I was delighted to see that three of the four pages was spent on my chapter, uh -huh. and nobody else was mentioned. <laughs> well, they were really that was good for my ego. Well, they were reasonably complimentary, I assume. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very much so. They really loved it. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> encouraged by that, uh, Dr. Louise Diamond and I first got together in the mid-80s, and she knocked on my door at the Foreign Service Institute and and uh, wanted them to start learning about international conflict. Mm -hmm. And so in Iowa, we got another grant from the U.S. Peace Institute to write a book, which we call Multitrack Diplomacy. It's now in its third edition. Okay. And what this did was to add more tracks uh, and to total of nine and to put it in a circle. Mm -hmm. And so we added, um, uh, we reorganized the track. Track one is government, track mm -hmm. two is Basically, it was an expansion of the whole concept of Track 2. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Track 2 was uh, were professionals, Track 3 the business, Track 4 citizen exchange, Track 5 was what we were doing, uh, education and training, mm -hmm. Track 6 was uh, peace activism, Track 7 religion, Track 8 was money because you have to raise money to do these things internationally, mm -hmm. and that center circle was Track 9, uh, this is what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, and that's communication, mm -hmm. which is what it's all about. I, I believe that um, what we do can be said in one word, and that's communicate, and that's our philosophy. Mm -hmm. So we call it a systems approach to peace. You have to get all of those groups working together mm -hmm. over time to bring about a peace process. Mm -hmm. That was the thrust. And it's now been used in about 35 universities in various parts of the world. Uh, and I just got word the other day from our publishers that uh, Beijing University is having it translated into, into Chinese, Chinese. Mm -hmm. and it will be on the Chinese market, That's which right. is great. Yeah. They need it. <laughs> well, and then I think you came back to Washington and we tempted you out to ICAR, uh, and you were planning IMTD at that particular point in time. What was your dream, what was your vision for IMTD, yours and Louise's? Well, you saved my life, you see. I came back here and uh, wasn't sure what to do, and you said, well, why don't you come out to George Mason, and uh, we'll set you up with an office and a computer and a telephone. I wanted to create this institute, but I didn't have a base to work from. And so that was very generous on your part, and I basically was there for a semester and met a lot of people. Uh, now, what happened was uh, I did the wrote the bylaws and the Articles of Incorporation to create the Institute for Multitrack mm -hmm. Diplomacy named after the book, and went down on uh, May 26, 1992 to the District of Columbia mm -hmm. to register as a, a not-for-profit corporation. I paid $26 and got, uh, got organized. Mm -hmm. And on that day, Louise Diamond and I, who partnered and are co-founders of the Institute, I had no money had no staff, had no space, we had no computers, we had nothing but a book and two dedicated people to make it happen. So it is possible <laughs> to make something happen <clears throat> starting basically uh, with no physical assets. So what was the dream that you and Louise had at the time for IMTD? What were you going to do with it? <clears throat> well, we really wanted to, we believed in our message and we wanted to spread it around the world mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> we thought that the way to do it and to build peace was to get involved in ethnic conflict in areas. Mm -hmm. And so we developed some basic strategies and some basic philosophies. Uh, for example, we only go where we are invited to go by the people in the conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important element because that means that you feel secure when you go there because those people will protect you. We also, in an effort to build trust, we um, make a five-year commitment to a project. It's not a weekend or a month, it's five years. We don't have the money to do that, but we have the professional and the personal and the institutional commitment mm -hmm. 
to be with those people as long as they want us there. And we were actually, our first project was Cyprus, and we were there for eight years. Uh, so that's a basic principle that we have always followed, and I think that's an important one for the field to recognize. And we always go and we listen. <clears throat> now, I know from my decades in the State Department that governments don't listen. And governments will come in and they'll tell you what your needs are and they'll fix them for you. Classic example is Iraq today. Mm -hmm. So we go and we listen. <clears throat> and uh, in our first, uh, first uh, conflict in Cyprus, we listened for several weeks, asked people what their needs were, was there any way that we as a small <coughs> NGO <coughs> could help. Uh, and uh, people began to say, well, yes, we really would like some training and field of conflict resolution, mm -hmm. and sort of took it from there. So that's sort of how we actually got started. Mm -hmm. What became of that Cyprus project? Because you've been doing it for a very long time, and <coughs> I know you've got many, many people on the island that have been through your training. And um, uh, well, actually, it's a it's a fascinating story, and I'll try to be brief about it. But we were invited there by one side, and and then we got permission from the United Nations to cross the other. You know, this is a divided mm -hmm. island, which you're quite familiar with. In 1960, it uh, was. Uh, part of the British Empire, and then they declared it a free nation. And for four years, uh, they did have freedom. In 1964, Greece got a little greedy, and there was an attempted coup to take over the island. And uh, a lot of what we call ethnic cleansing took place. And there was a meeting with the Security Council, and they put in a peacekeeping force in 64. Uh, and there was an uneasy peace. Uh, then in 74, the British, the, uh, the Turkish uh, government, in response to another attempted coup, sent in 35,000 troops mm -hmm. and a lot more killing. By this time, every Muslim moved to the north and every Christian moved to the south. Mm -hmm. You couldn't cross the Green Line where the UN forces were. Send a letter, make a phone call, and that was our first project. We mm -hmm. were invited there by people in the conflict. Well, <clears throat> it took us a lot of time to begin to build up relationships because uh, we don't advertise what we do. It's by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you train a small group and then they bring their friends the next time. And so gradually you expand the process, but you expand it by people who are dedicated to the concept of peace building. And that's an important uh, element. Mm. We don't just go on TV or radio and say, come see us. It, that, it doesn't work that way for us. And then we called on four track one entities. We called on Mr. Denktosh in the Turkish North. Mm -hmm. We called on Mr. Clarice in the Greek South. We called on the State Department in Washington and the ambassador on the island. We called on the United Nations in New York and on the island. And we said the same thing to all four track one people. <clears throat> we said, we have been invited onto your beautiful island by all of those tracks. <clears throat> in this multi-track system, except the money track, of course. And uh, we're just it's watching you the most know. Difficult. Huh? It's always the most difficult. I know. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. So I said, we just want you to know that we're here. We plan to continue our efforts. We invite you, Track One, to attend any one of our trainings. We're totally transparent. We have no secrets. Uh, we welcome your participation. But uh, this is what our plan is. And in each case, they didn't quite get it because this was too new a concept. So I said, I believe, fundamental in my belief system, is that every conflict can be resolved. There's no such thing as an intractable conflict over time. Uh, and I said, your conflict can be resolved. And at some point in the future, you're going to sign a peace treaty. Uh, and uh, all of the Turkish soldiers will go home. And all of the UN peacekeepers will go home and you'll have peace on your beautiful island for three weeks. And then someone from the far left or the far right will throw a bomb or kill somebody, be an act of violence. And by that time, we will have trained a critical mass of people from all of those tracks on your island. And they will have a connection in that village or that community where that act of violence took place. And they will go in there and they will contain the conflict 
so it doesn't spread across the island. Mm -hmm. The goal, I said to all four entities, is to break the cycle of conflict. If we can break the cycle of conflict, then peace has a chance. Mm -hmm. Well, they got that. I didn't ask for a piece of paper, uh, but I said, this is our goal, and we left, and uh, they never stopped us. We worked separately for 15 months with the Muslims in the North mm -hmm. and the Christians in the South, separately. And finally, that we had the trust, they had the skills, we brought six from each side together. Mm -hmm. And the Green Line, uh, under the United Nations, and the Lidra Palace, where there was some space. Right, well. And uh, these six were, <clears throat> we had, they never met before, <clears throat> we had politicians from both sides, we had <clears throat> business leaders, we had journalists, we had a poetess, we had a university president. And within an hour, they uh, bonded, and uh, we created them and made them into our steering committee, and they guided us over the years. Over the years, we trained some 2,500 people, with help from others, of course, uh, and we had got Fulbright program involved in the whole process, and Fulbright scholars would come there when we weren't there, and they would follow through and continue their work. So it was a terrific yeah. combination. I believe Ben Broom. Absolutely. He was outstanding. Yeah. He was outstanding. He was mm. And several other like him were also there over the years. Mm. So, and then we ran out of money and uh, we, uh, we, we stopped going there. But a fascinating thing happened uh, <clears throat> in April of last year, just a year ago, a little more. And the Deputy Prime Minister <clears throat> of uh, the North, Turkish Muslim North, raised the, the gate on the Green Line. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm doing this because I want the people from both sides to come together and get to know each other. Fantastic statement. In the first 24 hours, 5,000 people crossed that Green Line. Mm -hmm. And our people crossed the Green Line on both sides. And then they encouraged their friends and others to go because they said, it's okay, it's safe. You know, we know, we've been there. We work with these people over the mm -hmm. years. In the next 10 months, 700,000 people across the Green Line. Nobody was killed, no no acts of violence. And uh, then, the last figure I heard was uh, about a few months ago, two million people had crossed the Green Line. Now, there are only one million people on the island, yeah, people are going back and forth. And several times. Yeah. That's absolutely right, and had jobs on the other side. So, so a fantastic example mm -hmm. of a peace process that actually works. And. Uh, the beauty of the whole thing, from our point of view, people say, well, you know, what, what good did your work do? Well, what the deputy prime minister was one of the six Muslims who sat with us after 15 months of training. And we worked with him for over three years. Yeah. And now he was in a position of power to defy the mm -hmm. prime minister, who happened to be his father, and he raised the gate. Ah. Okay, so Dengtash's son Deng raised the gate. Uh -huh. Now that's pretty good. Yeah, mm. that's pretty good. good. So there are ways that, mm. but look how long it took. You know, yeah. it took ten years, twelve years. Well, that's and governments don't have the patience, you yeah. see, to stick with these things. Well, that's one of the problems, isn't it? The sort of length of time. But the other one you mentioned a couple of minutes ago is money. I mean, how have you managed? I mean. How have you managed to keep IMTD going all of these years as an NGO, which you know you don't solicit, you don't advertise? You know, I know from personal experience, you don't charge all that much. I mean, how do you actually manage to keep the thing? Well, it's a very difficult. Key? It's very difficult. Money is the key factor. If we had uh, <coughs> unlimited funds, we'd be four or five times larger than we are, because the need is there. Uh, I get asked at least once a month to uh, get involved in some conflict or other. Um, our database now is about 6,000 people uh, from 120 countries around the world. Uh, and the only way you get in the database is to have taken our training or to hear me speak, and I'll make 100 speeches a year, and give me your card, because you know, I talk to 50 people, and maybe five people come up and say they want more information, and that goes in the database, mm -hmm. and that's how we build it. Yeah. And so we're known around the world, but we don't have the funds to be responsive to many of those needs, and that's that's unfortunate. Uh, money is a, is always a key issue. Uh, we were 
two hours before our first birthday party in 1993, and we got a call from uh, the Hewlett Foundation mm -hmm. and said, uh, we just decided to give you $250,000 over three years, <clears throat> which was a great birthday. <laughs> right. Good birthday good gift. And that sort of launched us. Mm. And they have been uh, very key supporters over the years because they're the only institution that gives non-project money, overhead costs money in, in the whole world. And now, as you know, they've stopped as of this year. Right. And uh, a lot of people are hurting because of it, yes. including us. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, you're right. You're, we, you're just one of a large number That's of right. people that they've been supporting. Actually, at the moment, just to, because we are... Uh, we are we are short on funds. Uh, every, we have nobody on the payroll, myself or our executive director. Uh, yeah. Nobody's getting paid. It's all volunteer. Mm. The interns, of course, yeah. six or seven a semester uh, keep us going. Mm. Whenever we get a contract, we have a group of 14, 15 people that we call on under contract and mm. help with the training and mm. so forth. But we need the funds to do it. We can't keep them on the payroll. Mm which is difficult to manage, of course, as well. But we're hanging in there, and uh, someday, probably sooner rather than later, governments will realize that they need us uh, to do things that they're not doing. Yeah. I wonder why the, 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 the absence of, of contacts in Latin America, because until a few years ago, we had almost no contact down there at all. I mean, now that we've got quite a bit, but... Um, <clears throat> you know, it almost seems as though it's a sort of separate part of the world, uh, and my experience has been that they've got some very good people down there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We were asked by some people in Mexico City at one point to, to uh, go down to the southern part of Mexico and, and work with the, quote, dissidents there. And, uh, uh, yes, Chiapas. Chiapas, yeah. and mm. I refused because I said, uh, if Chiapas invites us, we'll go, but not if the business people yeah. invite us. Because wow. you, you have a different agenda than we do. <clears throat> so that's something you have to be careful about. Mm. And money also you have to look at. I remember <clears throat> we worked for five years in Israel and Palestine. Uh, <clears throat> and at one point the Ministry of Education <clears throat> in, uh, in Israel invited us with a very nice contract to uh, train their teachers mm -hmm. in these skills. And uh, <clears throat> we regretfully turned it down because we felt if we did that, why the Palestinians would feel that we were too partial and mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't participate. And our goal always had been in, in that conflict is to work with Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs, and Palestinians. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very few people will fund all three of those because for whatever reasons yeah. they, they're pushing their agenda. And so we have to be sensitive to where money comes from. Mm. Yeah. How successful do you think IMTD has been in your work? And um, um, have you had an, an impact on the State Department? I mean, you obviously, I think, have an advantage in being a diplomat and having, a, having access to previous colleagues and younger members of the State Department. Have you had, a, have you had any impact on the State Department? Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think the fact that I had the ambassador title mm. uh, really got the attention of the field as it yeah. was developing. They couldn't believe that anybody out of track one would pay any attention to them. Mm. And the fact that someone had been an ambassador uh, really uh, blew them away. Mm. And I think that was part of it. So I had something yeah. at least there to uh, bring to their attention. Uh, I have a lot of, of friends, as you say, and a lot of acquaintances. And I know most of the people in the field, even mm. going back to Ed Azar, who was, who was uh, way back in the, in the 80s, mid-80s, uh, but um, I, I guess I'm sort of a loner in that sense of the word, mm. uh, sort of independent. Uh, Louise and I were different. We had She was more spiritually related than mm. I was, and so we made a good combination. <clears throat> Actually, I had a couple of people that I asked to join our board when we were creating it who mm. basically turned it, us down <clears throat> because of Louise. He was too spiritual. Uh, and uh, so it was, uh, that didn't help uh, this collective concept very much. Yeah. You know? yeah. 
So I uh, maybe that's one of my weaknesses that I've proceeded uh, mm. too much alone, uh, in the sense that uh, we stuck with this concept. Yeah. And there are various people who said, "Oh, you want to take this out or add this or whatever," and we haven't done that. Mm. Uh, I felt it took seven years to develop this, uh, and I felt comfortable with continuing on mm. that path. This was not something that happened overnight. This evolved over time, mm. as I think any good theories do. And so we, we stuck with it, and that might have bothered some people. Uh, that's hard to say, but I, w I would, uh, that's the sort of way I come out. How successful do you think you've been in sort of uh, carrying through the original dream, and what do you think you might do have done differently if you had known what you know now? <laughs> I, I'm leaving aside the money thing. Okay? That's the key. <laughs> yes, all right, yes. I wouldn't change anything. Uh -huh. I really, I'm quite content with what we've been able to achieve over the years. Mm. I'm just sorry that we haven't been able to expand as I think we should. Um, what I've done actually, uh, well, let me just say for the record uh, where we have worked, and then I want to come back for a moment on a couple of things. Okay. We worked in, in Israel, Palestine, worked in Cyprus, we worked in Bosnia since 1996, uh, we worked in uh, India, Pakistan, Kashmir, Nepal. Sri Lanka and the Caucasus in Georgia, mm. and we worked in seven or eight countries in Africa. Worked in Liberia. You and I worked yeah, there together. Right, we did, didn't we? Uh, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, now the Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, and starting in Sudan, hopefully shortly. So uh, that sort of gives you an idea of <coughs> where we've uh, <coughs> practiced these basic skills over the, over the, over the years. <clears throat> but also we've done some interesting things <clears throat> that three are worth mentioning <clears throat> that are basically ideas <clears throat> and uh, all and, and no money is involved. It's just dedication, time, energy and, uh, and process of pushing. Mm. Um, one of the best examples is uh, in Kashmir where we've worked uh, for the last uh, five years or so. And in the year 2000, then uh, I was addressing a refugee camp uh, outside of Musafirabad, the capital of Pakistan, Kashmir. I came up with the idea of a, a people's bus. The year before, Prime Minister of India had gone from uh, Delhi to Lahore by bus and met with the Prime Minister of Pakistan and they issued the Lahore Declaration. Mm -hmm and it was about Kashmir, and it was positive. It fell apart six months later for other reasons, but everybody in that camp remembered that yeah. political bus. I said, a people's bus which would bring together divided families from Srinagar, the capital of Indian Kashmir, linking to Musafirabad, the capital of Pakistan Kashmir. So the road is okay, it needs a couple of new bridges that were blown up, but mm. politically it's 120 miles apart on the same river just have to raise that barrier the line of control was put there in 1964. Well, they thought this was a fantastic idea. Mm. So I came back here and started pushing. And touched in the press, we got a front page cover picture mm -hmm. on one of the key magazines in Pakistan quoting us. They call us a think tank, by the way, which I've never been called before. <laughs> well, and, not uh, a bad thing to be. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, pushed never met near the State Department, never met, we're at track one in this country. They wouldn't understand. <clears throat> but <clears throat> talked to the ambassadors and pushed and wrote letters to prime ministers and presidents. Anyway, last October, uh, <clears throat> the Indian government proposed three or four track two initiatives, and they used the word track two, which was kind of fun. And one of them was my people's bus idea. Mm -hmm. And they said, let's do it, let's do it. Link divided families, used it in my identical language. And the Pakistan government agreed four or five days later. They had recently, they've had two meetings uh, talking about this. And then there was an election in India, as you know, and the party in power was defeated. And the Congress party is now back in. So I was in Delhi three weeks ago and there was a, on the front page of the leading English language newspaper, it said that the new foreign minister of uh, India had just met with the foreign minister of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. 
And on the front page it said they've agreed to the Srinagar Musafirabad bus. Right on the front page. Yeah. So that was pretty exciting. And yeah. they had another meeting a few days ago, and I hope that will start in September or October. Yeah. It's just an idea, but it's a symbol of peace building in that conflicted area. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, that's an idea which, which uh, we were able to successfully push. Yeah. Uh, the second <clears throat> has to do with the country of Libya. Again, no money involved, just some ideas. For the last five years we've been working uh, trying to see if we can improve relations between the two countries. Mm. We helped to create an NGO in Tripoli, the first of its kind. We work with a new NGO here, Libyan American Friendship Association, and uh, <clears throat> tried to bring people back and forth but couldn't get visas. Uh, well, last we got a couple of individual visas, but that was all. <clears throat> but last September, after the UN had lifted its sanctions on Libya, why well, I went to the State Department, met with the Libyan desk officer, and said, how would it be if uh, we brought a Libyan soccer team from Tripoli to play DC United in RFP mm -hmm. Stadium here in Washington, DC? The symbolism of it, of course, and then they would go to Libya. Well, as luck would have it, he was, uh, the desk officer was a great soccer fan. He said it was a great idea. I said, well, you push from the bottom up, and he said, absolutely. So I wrote a letter to the assistant secretary involved, and, and uh, on the, October the 8th, I got a call back from his office saying that the time was not quite ripe, using Bill Zartman's phrase of ripeness, uh -huh. uh, for this to happen. And I said, well, let me keep in touch. Mm. Well, I didn't know they had secret negotiations going on, of course, in mid-December, where the whole thing yeah. shifted. Mm. So I called him back after that, and I said, is the time now ripe for soccer? Mm -hmm. He said, well, it's getting pretty good. So I said, uh, well, what are you doing next to prepare for this shift? And he mm -hmm. said, we're making a, a list of subjects to talk about with the foreign ministry in Tripoli. And I thought, well, let me ask him. I said, is soccer on the list? Mm -hmm. There was a long pause, and he said, yes. <laughs> so the desk officer had done his job. Uh -huh. And I said, well, how would it be if I uh, called my friends in Tripoli and got them to go to the uh, foreign ministry yeah. and get soccer on their list. Mm -hmm. He said, that's a good idea. Yeah. So I picked up the phone, called Tripoli. Three days later, we got an email back saying it's on their list. And so to make a long story short, the, uh, because of visa difficulties, because they still haven't opened an office yet uh, yeah. in Libya to give visas, the DC United is playing in December in Tripoli, and in the early spring, come Tripoli here. will come here. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You know, if mm -hmm. Kissinger can do it with ping pong, and John Marks can do it with wrestling yeah. in Iran, mm -hmm. we can do it with soccer in Libya. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, that again is an idea, mm -hmm. with no money, that, uh, that that we've been able to pursue. Mm -hmm. The last one, well, I got I got another one. Uh, the last, so the third one <coughs> is um, about the EU. You might mm -hmm. be interested in this. <coughs> about four months ago. I got the idea, worrying about the merger of the 10 with the 15, which mm -hmm. is going to take, didn't take place on the 1st of May. Eight of those 10 new countries were part of the communist world for decades, and Malta and Cyprus were the other two, mm -hmm. and Cyprus, of course, still has its problem. And I remember that East Germany, West Germany, it took tens of billions of dollars and years, to, and they still have problems yeah. coming together after 40 years. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody in the EU Commission of some 15 or 20,000 people is focusing on this process in that kind of detail. So I have proposed the creation of a new post called a Commissioner for Peace. They have 25 commissioners. They're rejuggling them right now. And why not have a Commissioner for Peace who focuses on the merger of the 10 with the 15 and the conflicts, hopefully nonviolent, that will take place, and then looking ahead 2007, when Romania and Bulgaria come in, which are even further out, right. mm. there's a lot of problems there. Yeah. And so I wanted to create an institutional base. So we did up an eight, which was one of our interns is brilliant on this, an eight-page paper of proposing, with all the terms of reference and all the things that should be looked at, of a commissioner of peace. Mm. And through some informal, unexpected contacts, uh, that document is now in the hands of the foreign minister of Holland. 
because Holland took over on the 1st of July to chair the minister yeah. ministerial conference of the EU. Yeah. They're the best country in Europe, with my concern, to put forward that idea yeah. of the Commissioner for Peace. And I'm hopeful that something will happen. Well, it's certainly a good conflict avoidance strategy. Exactly. And, you know, <coughs> exactly. Good. Well, best of luck. What's the, what's the and my last on? example uh, has to do with water and peace. Oh. Yeah. When I was at the State Department in 1980, uh, I was able to launch the first UN decade on drinking water and sanitation. It took about a year and a half in the State Department. And uh, we had a three-day special session of the General Assembly, and 40 ministers of development spoke to it, and it was adopted unanimously. Well, in that first 10 years, and I was involved in a lot of that, I was the coordinator for the decade in the State Department. Uh, so at the end of that 10-year period, according to the World Health Organization, 1.1 billion people in the world got access to safe water for the first time in their lives. And 769 million people got access to sanitary facilities. Well, that's a lot of people. And uh, then the thing dropped off the, uh, the scale in 1990 when the decade was over. And uh, people sort of forgot about it. Mm -hmm. But then the Millennium Conference of 2000, Johannesburg of 2002, both had top-level paragraphs focusing on 2015. Mm. Pardon me. And they said, so, and all governments agreed uh, unanimously, that by the year 2015, the world should reduce by half, not whole, but by half the yeah. people without access to war and sanitation. Yeah. So I drafted a resolution uh, before Johannesburg uh, laying out the goals and uh, what I thought could take place to make that a reality. Mm. And how do you restructure the United Nations? How do you restructure and get the world to focus on this seriously? And so I call it the second UN Water Decade. Mm. So I visited Track One governments. <clears throat> I talked to the U.S. I talked to the Brits. <clears throat> I talked to uh, the French, uh, the Dutch, the Norwegians, the Swedes, mm. Canadians, the Japanese. I needed some government to be a sponsor at the United Nations and take the lead role for this resolution, because that's the only way you get anything passed. Mm -hmm. NGO can't do it. No. And they all said no. Oh, They're not really so. interested. Uh, mm -hmm. So I then went in early August of last year, I went to Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. now, why Tajikistan? And where is Tajikistan? Well, most American never heard of it. You know, much to know where it is. It's the RLC. Well, I, I went to them because a couple of years ago <clears throat> they had gotten their act together at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. They passed unanimously a resolution declaring the year 2003, which was last year, as the UN year of fresh water. Wow. Okay. And they were on the map for the first mm -hmm. time after their conflict and all this yeah. was a positive thing that they could really use. And I said to the ambassador, you've had a great job doing this and you're really on the map. Mm -hmm. Let's take this for 10 years. Let's make it a decade. Mm -hmm. Keep you on the map for 10 more years. Well, obviously, he thought that was a great idea. Oh, not sure. Yeah. But he said, you have to convince my president. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know who his president was. But he said, I'll help. So I wrote a letter, and I wrote in the resolution, and I sent it to the ambassador, addressed to the mm -hmm. president, and he forwarded it to the president, supporting it. And two weeks later, the timing was perfect, two weeks later, the president con had convened, or did convene then, at the end of August, a, uh, a conference in his capital, Dushanbe, on water, and had about a thousand people there from the region, and a lot of people from the uh, UN and so forth. And in his opening speech, he proposed a second decade yeah. on board. Right. Yeah. And they approved the idea, so mm -hmm. he told his ambassador to get on the horn and do something about mm -hmm. it. So then we worked together with my contacts. I was able to deliver all of the Latin American boats in the Caribbean, Central, mm -hmm. South America. And uh, I said to him, don't go near the West. The tactic is to get 120 developing countries mm -hmm. signed up and the West will come along. Mm -hmm. So I got 120 because you have to have all 192 nations have to agree. Yeah. So we got 120 and then 
the Canadians were the first to break. Yeah. And then the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Spain and Portugal and the EU, and then everybody came on board, and finally the U.S. toward the end. And on December 23rd, uh, last December, the United Nations General Assembly adopted unanimously, without a vote, without an a, uh, explanation of vote mm -hmm. or a reservation, all 192 nations approved the second decade. Yeah. Again, no money. Mm -hmm. An idea, we had. We worked on this very intensely for a year and a half. And maybe that's one of my difficulties, by doing these things without getting money for it. But this was important yeah. to peace. Mm -hmm. Because I can, am concerned about potential conflict over water issues sure. in the, the next several decades. Mm -hmm. And this, you can bring water to people, safe water, they're not going to fight over it and mm. bring it to them. So that's my fourth and last example of well, how we've been able to project new ideas on the scene mm. without money, just manpower. Mm. Uh, you've got one other advantage though, John, if you'll forgive my saying so, and that's that you you do have a great deal of credibility as as a former diplomat. I mean, you can go and see desk officers in state, so you, you do no. have some impact Absolutely. upon, upon uh, the State Department. No, I, well, I agree with that. Also, I spent, and this is interesting, I spent 17 years of my 40-year career on the United Nations Economic yeah. and Social Affairs. Mm -hmm. So, so I know how to manage bureaucracies, and mm -hmm. this is critical, both in the UN and in, in the US. Mm -hmm. And that, that experience, I, I agree with you, is, is what has made what I do possible. Yeah. Um, it's a big advantage over people who are just purely academics and don't know how the system that, works. That's right. That's so I, I have mean. tried to build on that. You're yeah. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that it's been it's been useful contribution to me. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a training in conflict resolution skills, but it's broader based mm -hmm. on taking a larger vision of what is peace in the world mm -hmm. and seeing if we can influence that in various ways. It's also the importance of ideas, I think, mm -hmm. you know, innovations, changes, and I think that you know, a good idea is worth its mm -hmm. weight in gold, mm -hmm. even if you can't get the gold to implement it. So, well, also, yeah. another thing that's useful is about ideas is a lot of people have ideas, but you have to have perseverance mm -hmm. <laughs> to make yes. them happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's, uh, so this is, I guess over the, over the decades, my focus has been on doing things, mm -hmm. not just talking about them or writing about mm -hmm. them, but actually doing them. Well, I have produced eight books in the process, but it's the doing part yeah. that I think is critical. All right, let, let's just talk a few moments about your views about the future of the field and uh, also, of course, the future of IMTD. What, where do you see us going? Um, well, I worry so. about the field. Mm. for two reasons. First of all, we don't communicate enough mm. within the field. And now the, the Alliance, uh, which is a collection you know, of a number of uh, NGOs, which we helped to start actually mm. seven or eight years ago, <clears throat> as uh, we were the charter members of mm. three groups that came together. <clears throat> and uh, that was Louise Diamonds. I spent a lot of time mm. on that. This is the uh, ACT, <coughs> the Alliance for... Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, now it's called the Alliance. And mm. they got uh, a lot of money from the Hewlett Foundation, mm -hmm. and I don't know what's going to happen next year uh, to that uh, that concept, but they're trying to bring people together mm -hmm. to communicate, yeah. which I think is useful. But um, in my experience, the, the pie is getting smaller, mm -hmm. and more people are trying to access a smaller pie, and that's not good, mm -hmm. because they're now beginning to not communicate very well, mm. even some place worse than they have in the past, because they're jealously guarding their little piece of the pie and don't want anybody else mucking around there. And that's not good. Mm. It all centers around money. And uh, I also see the, the funding field narrowing, mm. and that's even more frightening. It should be expanding also, but it's not. Classic examples, the Hewlett Foundation is, is one. Uh, Carnegie Corporation in New York is another. Mm. Uh, they were global in their outreach, and we got money for Cyprus from them. They got a new president who decided, after a year and a half of looking inward, they, that uh, they were going to shift. So now they have, internationally, they're funding 15 libraries in Africa. Mm. Not a very risk-taking operation. And five universities in Russia. And that's about it. 
where they were broadly interested in, in our field uh, and they're now backed out of it. And the same thing happened to Pew several years ago. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And then McKnight Foundation in Minneapolis, uh, they funded our work in the business community in India, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And back for more money, the program officer was ecstatic about what we were doing. The board shifted mm -hmm. and they decided now to fund only things in Minnesota. I mean, those are totally out of your control. Yeah. The South Sakawa Peace Foundation that helped us because McKnight had helped us, and when they heard McKnight had stopped, they stopped. So it's the, the actually the people with the money are growing fewer. The field is contracting, and that's very serious. Mm. Can we do something about that? I mean, how, how can we reverse the trend? Is it possible? I don't know. I keep trying, <laughs> mm. but it's uh, there are no easy answers. Yeah. If governments would bless the concept, you know, then. And foundations are. I have learned that foundations are very conservative bodies. Mm. They're not risk takers either. They like to be sure, you know, well, 15 libraries, that sounds good. You can count the books, you know. You don't know how many people read the books, but you can count the books. Right. And uh, so they are becoming more conservative, in my experience, and less risk taking than even a few years ago. Mm. And that's not good for the field. So I worry about the field itself. Mm because there are those groups that are now downsizing and, and they'll probably be dropping off the, the edge. Sure. Uh, some of them already have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's too bad because we're producing now more talent and more people who want to get jobs in the field. I get asked every other day for help in getting someone getting yeah. a job. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody, nobody out there is hiring yeah. uh, in this field. So you can go the academic route and maybe hope to get a teaching job, but I mean, practitioners are, they're just not there. Yeah. Uh, their jobs are not there yeah. for practitioners. Uh, and so that to me is a major concern mm -hmm. because from my point of view, the conflict in the world is growing. Today, there, according to experts in Sweden, <coughs> there, there are 37 conflicts in the world. How much more than a thousand people will die this year? <coughs> and every one of them is within national boundaries. They're all intra-state conflict. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we're designed as a world to deal with interstate conflict. Mm -hmm. And if governments don't get the shift, then they're not going to put in the funds. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one bright spot in AID. Uh, they opened a new office six or seven months ago called uh, Conflict uh, uh, Mitigation mm -hmm. and uh, Management. And the woman in charge is terrific because she's been in the field. She knows what it's all about. And now with the new, there's a whole new shift that you might not have heard about. That Mr. Bush in 2002 in Monterey, Mexico, said that the U.S. would provide $5 billion in new money over the next three years <clears throat> to focus on governments, countries that were trying to move in up the line. Uh -huh. They did things about controlling corruption and so yeah. forth and so on. Yeah. Well, that... Democratization process, yeah. Uh, they call it the Millennium Corporation. Uh -huh. It's not a government agency. It's separate from the State Department, mm -hmm. separate from AID. And Mr. Colin Powell is chairman of the board at the moment, but they just have launched a new president, hired a new president. It's only about three months old mm -hmm. now, and they're now in the process of identifying those countries who will be eligible for that kind of money. Mm -hmm. But what this is doing and Mr. Hanatsios, the administrator of AID, recognized that a couple of months ago in a speech. He said now that two-thirds of our clients, countries in, in USAID, have internal conflict. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds, because they're, get, they're getting the ones that are left yeah. behind, right. and they're not getting more money. Mm -hmm. And they said, he said, we don't know how to do that. Well, it's true, they don't. Mm -hmm. And so though we're seeing if we can be of some help to them and training them in some skills. But he said, I want every officer and aide to shift the way he thinks about conflict. Mm -hmm. Well, that's quite a challenge, shall we yeah. say. And uh, so I worry about the fact that uh, it's even going to be more difficult because the, the guys with the less conflict are moving forward with other money mm -hmm. and the other people are being left behind even mm -hmm. further. Yeah. And that's a, to me, that's a challenge for the world. Mm -hmm. I also think that it's a shame that the State Department hasn't identified a unit within its boundaries to focus on these issues. Now, uh, Canada and the UK have done this. Mm -hmm. They have a small office in Canada focusing on this, and there is an office also in 
in the UK and, and uh, DFID, your yeah. aid agency, gets it. Yes. They really get it as an institution. Mm. And that is uh, terrific. We have been working in Norway, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Nepal, mm. uh, with the untouchables. Mm -hmm. That's the root cause of the yeah. conflict in Nepal is the caste system. And uh, there are 5 million out of 25 million people are untouchable. That's 20% of the population. Mm. And in our last several years there, we've been working with them and urging them, I urge them to create their own political party, mm -hmm. and get, because the Constitution is uh, very favorable to them and is not being honored by anybody in the country or the government. Well, one of our interns has now proposed uh, a project where he would go there and do a research project in Nepal about the role of the untouchables mm -hmm. and how the Maoist situation has taken advantage of that. Uh, by going to the untouchables and treating them like human beings. And they have been, the the, uh, the uh, little group that we're talking about in Kathmandu has been funded in the past by the British, mm. and they have now, uh, have now discussing with the British as we speak, funding my intern to go there. Not the aid mission, yeah. it's the British who understand it. Mm. And I think that's terrific. But you know, more governments, including our own, have to go through this process. Mm. As, and if we can activate the business community, put money on the line, which I haven't done yet in any big way, then that is also a potential right. breakthrough. I think, we, I think we're going to have to think less about foundations, more about individuals with regard to donor relationships, and more about um, the business community. Mm. Uh, and hopefully governments will come along thereafter.